so welcome, my name's Jasmine Heiss, and I am the Deputy Director of the Coalition for Public Safety. Together with our sister organization, Justice Action Network, and our eight national partners, we make up the largest national bipartisan effort to reform the criminal justice system. I think what's apparent, however, is that with this growing bipartisan consensus that our criminal justice system is too big, too ineffective, too fundamentally unfair, uh, there is a, a piece that's missing, and that is the experience of women who are incarcerated in our prisons and jails. And I think that the attendance, both at this conference and certainly in this room, shows that there's not only a willingness, but an appetite to talk about these issues. Um, I would venture that almost everyone here knows that a quarter of the world's prisoners are in the United States. Less talked about, however, is the fact that despite the fact that the United States only has 5% of the world's women, we have 30% of the world's incarcerated women. So, just a little bit of feedback, am I good? Excellent. Um, our panel this morning is focused on the issue of treatment and rehabilitation in the justice system. However, discussing that question of treatment and rehabilitation inevitably brings us to even larger questions about the nature of our criminal justice system, including what is bringing women into contact with the system in the first place? How does that relate to the communities that those women come from? And what is the responsibility of those communities in making change? What is the role of women in fundamentally reimagining our system and can a system that is predicated on correctional control rather than compassion ever truly correct? Now these are big questions, but I'm very fortunate not to be tackling them alone. We have a brilliant panel of women this morning who are not only advocates, but change makers in communities across the country, from New York to Louisiana to right here in Maryland. Um, so without further ado, let me introduce to you today's panel. Immediately to my right, we have Gail Smith. Next to her, a proud Baton Rouge native and representative of the state of Louisiana, Representative Pat Smith. Uh, we have Dr. Bronwyn Hunter, who did not come far. She's just here from the University of Maryland, where she's an assistant professor of psychology. And then finally, we have Miyoshi Benton from New York of the Women in Justice Project. So welcome, ladies. Please join me in giving them a round of applause. And to ground our conversation today so that you have a sense of who these women are, where their experiences are coming from, I'm going to invite each of our panelists to begin by sharing their life, their work, and how they come into contact with this issue of women's incarceration. So Miyoshi, if we can begin with you. Great. Um, good morning, everyone. My name is Miyoshi Benton. Um, I would like to start by saying thank you to Just Justice Action Network for inviting me here to speak. Um, I am an associate at the Women in Justice Project, um, and our goal is to center the leader of directly impacted women in ending mass incarceration in the U.S. I'm sorry, it's really loud. We have, we have a little feedback, but we'll push through it. Okay. You good? Okay. Um, and we do that, and our main strategies to do that is organizing advocacy, storytelling, and public education. And our lead and principle is that women directly impacted by incarceration should be and have the right to be at the forefront of um, correcting our criminal justice system, or transforming is what we really say. Um, and I came into this work because I was directly impacted by being incarcerated. And during my incarceration, when I first was arrested, I was pregnant at the time, and I also um, had a one-year-old son at the time. Um, and during that time, I experienced lack of sufficient amount of food while I was pregnant. Um, the medical treatment was horrendous at best. Um, they deny you your, your basic needs of like sanitary napkins and toilet paper, toilet paper tissue. And they identified you as um, a label. You lost your identity as a human being. And another experience that I had to endure was being shackled, which I'm not too sure if any of you are really familiar with that, but that consists of handcuffs, waist chain, a black box to your stomach while pregnant with ankle shackles. Um, and through this horrific experience of being shackled while pregnant and hearing all the stories and having to, to live and breathe this kind of reality, um, upon coming home, I realized that I needed to get involved. I needed to be that advocate. I needed to be that voice for all the women 
um, that suffered, and not only for myself, but for the woman that should come behind me and that would have to suffer the injustices and the inhumane conditions that I had to deal with. So I became a lead um, advocate in a legislative campaign, which um, my organization ran, and also um, partnered with Gail from the Women in um, Prison Project, right? And um, we had the leading, so, sorry. We now have, the anti-shackling campaign that was run in 2015 now have the most progressive law banning the shackling of pregnant women in the United States. And I can, I can definitely talk to you more about that a little later. I just wanted to highlight in the beginning is that our work is so centered around women and the one who had the lived experience to be at the forefront. And we believe that because we are the ones who suffer, so we should be the ones who comes up with the solutions because we know best. So we use our expertise, we share them, and we work side by side with allies in order to correct and to transform this criminal justice system that we now have. But we also need to recognize that there's so many key components that came into women coming into the criminal justice system before. And it shows us that who we value in society is women of color, is women from low-income communities who we did not value that came into this criminal justice system and who we continue to traumatize and brutalize and dehumanize. And I think that's important to recognize that it's so many root causes that are, you know, driv who's driving the forces of why us women are coming into the criminal justice system and why it has skyrocketed so much. Thank you. Thank you. Bronwyn. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for having me here. I'm excited to be here today. Um, so my name is Bronwyn Hunter, and I'm an assistant professor at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. Um, the way that I really became involved in focusing on women in the justice system was through some personal experience with women who had been in touch with the justice system. And I was really taken back by the lack of resources that were available for women in general, um, but specifically for women when they were getting ready to come home. Um, I grew up in Connecticut, and for example, Connecticut has three parole-based halfway houses for women throughout the entire state. Um, and that's kind of it, um, you know? So if a woman is going to try and leave prison, um, it's very challenging because the resources just aren't there. I was also really taken back by seeing women perpetuating this cycle, um, what we stare typically think of as the revolving door, right? People, women coming in and out. And again, it, it goes back to this idea that there's a lack of resources in the community. Um, and so I was really fortunate to have many wonderful training experiences and research and clinical work. Um, I had the opportunity to work in the Cook County Sheriff's Women's Justice Program, which is, was the only um, gender responsive treatment program in a jail system um, for women who are incarcerated. And while I was there, they had actually expanded at one point to include um, a community-based initiative so that women who were housed in the program could actually continue to receive free services upon release. Um, I've also worked on research projects looking at different types of housing for women who are coming out of the justice system. Um, and as I've been engaged in some of this work, um, one thing that has really struck me is that we often think about criminal justice involvement and women who are in the system um, as somehow being individually responsible for ending up in the criminal justice system. And I really like to reframe this as thinking of it as a community challenge, um, that really we need to understand that um, re being justice involved is not an individual flaw. It's a systemic and community problem and challenge that has really perpetuated our society um, and continues um, to this day, as we can see with the large number of women who are incarcerated and the continued lack of resources and services focused on these women. My current work in the Baltimore area focuses on engaging with community-based organizations that provide gender responsive treatment programming to try and build capacity um, for evaluation um, and for research. And I also look at the stigma related to having a criminal record and understanding how 
um, the stigma can impact um, somebody's life in terms of feeling rejected and discriminated against by society. So for example, um, a mother who, um, who may have been formerly incarcerated in the school district in my county in Maryland would have to actually pass a background check in order to go to their child's school. Um, and so how do we understand and break down those barriers um, for women who are formerly incarcerated? Um, so thank you for having me. Good morning. Uh, I'm State Representative Patricia Haynes-Smith from Baton Rouge, Louisiana. And um, I've been involved in this issue for some time. I served on the school board uh, in East Baton Rouge Parish for 13 years. And during that period of time, I was always invited to go and speak at graduations and prisons Martin Luther King Day programs, black history programs. So it gave me kind of an insight as to what was really going on in uh, both men and women's prisons in Louisiana. And it was through that, uh, that lens that I saw the disparity on how the men's prisons were operated and the women's prisons in, in, uh, in East Baton Rouge Parish in particular. Um, so when I got elected to the uh, uh, state uh, represented position in 2007, uh, I decided that it was going to be something that I would take on along with education because I believe the two go hand in hand. Education, since folks are in prison earning their uh, GED or getting literacy and then looking at what was happening in our prisons. And one thing in particular in the women's prison, uh, I, I noticed and would always ask, what are the training programs that you have for our women? And it always came up that they were doing culinary, horticulture, you would not believe it, childcare, but upholstery. I said upholstery, okay. Uh, what are they gonna do with that? So those are the kinds of things that we were, we were faced with and still are faced with in, uh, in Louisiana in particular. So uh, some of the bills that I, I decided that I would put bills in and continue my uh, advocacy for training programs for women in, uh, in prison and uh, started to introduce a lot of bills that some of them passed, some of them didn't. Uh, some that did pass were uh, bills that I did work with with our uh, Department of Corrections. I did pass a geriatric bill, which was one that allowed individuals who were 60 years old uh, after serving 10 years, nonviolent offenders, who went through a series of classes to be able to uh, apply for eligibility for, for parole. And those are the kinds of things that when you think about it, being smart on crime is allowing people to be eligible to go before the parole board to determine whether or not they can get out or not, whether they're ready to go into society. But whenever my bills didn't pass, I would always, always say to the committee, I'll be back. <laughs> so I've been known as persistent Pat uh, in the legislature because I do bring back bills every year, even though they didn't pass, I bring them back because I think it's important that we could persist on letting folks know that if you're an advocate for something, you really have to uh, work hard at trying to get them done. Uh, and so I have some bills passed. I've had, I'm still working on the uh, voting rights for felons, for pretrial voting rights for individuals who don't get to vote in Louisiana, which is a disenfranchisement of their voting rights. But one thing I'm very proud of in particular, uh, after getting our women's caucus to go and visit with the uh, women at LCIW, um, I had a conversation with our secretary of uh, corrections, and I said to him, and I call him Jimmy, I said, Jimmy, we're still giving this uh, upholstery class to women in prison. Why? So he brought a list to me of all the upholstery companies in Louisiana, and I laughed. Uh, I said, Jimmy, they're not gonna get hired at these places. People throw couches away, they throw everything away. So they're not gonna use that. Why not teach them welding? Why not take them down to the men's prison, in fact, since you're already teaching it there, to the, uh, take the women down to the men's prison and teach them welding, and their jaws dropped. Like, we can't do that. There's no way we could do that. Well, they found a way, because there was a mobile welding unit at Angola, and I'm sure you've all heard of Angola. <laughs> Uh, there was a mo mobile welding unit at Angola, and it was moved to LCIW, and they found a woman uh, welding instructor, and 20 more or more women were actually learning to weld. Now, LCIW has been in flux uh, for a while now because 
they were flooded in uh, 2016. So the prison is closed. And guess where some of the women are housed? At the men's prison, at Hunt's. Uh, they're in a wing there, but some are scattered all over uh, right now. But one of the things that I have to say is that you, you cannot give up on your advocacy for something that you're really passionate about. And this, for me, even though I'm in my last term in the House, will always be my passion, even when I run for the Senate. <laughs> <laughs> So I came to this issue initially because I heard during law school a panel of women talk mm. about what their incarceration had done to their children. It wasn't about how they were being treated. It wasn't about anything about their offense or sentencing. It was about what was happening to their kids. So one of the first things I want to lift up, and I, and I thank Miyoshi and her sisters for New York having the most progressive law. It was Warnice Robinson in Illinois who first raised this issue, and, and not by herself, but really uh, spearheading this effort, made Illinois the first state in the nation to ban shackling only during labor, it was not throughout pregnancy. So I, I think it's critically important that we lift up and listen to and never forget about the voices of the women that are impacted, and then secondly, the voices of their children and the experience of those children. Um, uh, Senator Kamala Harris took about 80% of what I was planning to say in this opening <laughs> statement, uh, which is great. I, uh, she's amazing. Um, the one thing that she didn't say, and she, she, she said, you know, one third of the, of the world's women in prison, that's wrong. You know, having to have officers, you know, when you're, sh that's wrong. The one thing I felt that she missed, separating a mother from a, young, from a newborn infant or a young child, that's wrong. The impact is lasting. The impact goes on far beyond when they reunite in most families and, and usually into the next generation. Um, in many states, 80% of the people in prison at some point were touched by the foster care system, in foster care at some point during their childhood. I think that's a stunning statistic and something that we have to pay attention to. It's, I don't think we think enough about the fact that that does not have to be a given, that we do not have to incarcerate, that there are better ways, wiser ways of dealing with criminal offenses, of dealing with harm reduction. So, so that's um, my first point. Second point, the trauma pathways. Um, I've spent most of my career in Chicago representing moms and children's guardians. And again and again and again, the pattern of a mom who was sexually abused as a child, self-medicated, got into an addiction and then committed petty offenses that earned her a stunningly long sentence in prison, being re-traumatized on a daily basis. That has to stop. We have to think more creatively. We have to think more holistically. Um, they, we, they asked on the phone call about model programs. I have some direct experience with two, one in Chicago and one in New York, Women's Treatment Center. Uh, gender informed, trauma informed, gender specific treatment in the community where moms live with their kids, very rich in community based services, in their first 10 years of existence had not one woman rearrested, not one of the women who went through their program. That's incredible. I mean, when you think about. You know, 50%, right, you, um, of women who leave the prison system tend to, tend to go back because they have been re-traumatized, because they have not gotten what they needed. And then the second one, and I, I think we often make this dichotomy between um, violent and nonviolent offenses, steps to end, end family violence, which is taking women, some of whom have been charged with very serious offenses, and had an 18.5 percent re-arrest re rate, not necessarily for violent offenses, but 18.5 compared to, in many states, more than 50 percent recidivism. That's a successful program, and it's working um, specifically with women who are survivor defendants, women who've been 
deeply affected by intimate partner violence and then charged with a crime as a result. So there are good models out there. There's no, no reason for us um, to have to rely on mass incarceration. Um, and I think I'm gonna leave it at that. Wonderful, thank you all so much. Um, so we will eventually get to questions from all of you because I'm sure you're eager to speak to our panelists. I feel very lucky to have the opportunity to do so on a stage. Um, but just a few sort of moderated questions first. Miyoshi, I'm gonna begin with you. You spoke about the experience of shackling, which is not only not supportive of treatment and rehabilitation, it's an additional form of trauma and harm enacted by the prison. Um, can you go into a little bit more about how, as we reimagine what what incarceration looks like, prisons and jails need to serve women's most fundamental needs before we even begin to have a more ambitious conversation? Um, I think it's important to start out with saying that we need to have these conversations about the fundamental basic needs of what women need inside, but also have the same conversation at the same time of we need to stop incarcerating women. Like we need to address what is happening before incarceration becomes a factor. Um, it's important to know that prison, the culture of prison is punishment control, punishment dehumanization, brutalization. These are the actual essence of what the prison culture consists of. So if we're being realistic, how can we really have a prison system that is actually giving people the human basic needs that they need if the very essence of the prison system is so hostile and so counterproductive to what we are asking for, or what we're demanding, or what we need. Um, but for examples of what should come to everybody, to every woman, to every person, to every human being, um, is addressing the trauma. Like, if we know nine out of 10 women had some form of trauma in their lifetime before coming to prison, then we need to know that in that kind of environment, there should be programs for trauma. It should be staff being trained around um, trauma so they know how to handle situations. But then again, it's a, it's a prison, so how effective can that really be? Like, how safe can you really feel when you do have correctional officers that are inflicting this trauma that you, at one point in life, experienced um, in society? Um, for me, another thing is medical treatment. I know personally, when I was pregnant, I received horrific, like I said before, medical treatment where um, I had something as simple as a UTI, which is a urinary tract infection. Um, I was two months pregnant at the time of my arrest, and upon my first visit to the doctor, they said, oh, you have a UTI, you know, you get some antibiotics, and then it's done. Every visit after that, they kept saying that the UTI was gone. Um, it wasn't until after I gave birth to my daughter that they realized, and they tested the placenta, sent it to the lab, that they realized that the infection, that the UTI that I had at two months pregnant was a UTI that grew the whole time I was pregnant where my child was growing mm. and that the infection traveled to her brain. Wow. Something so simple as receiving, mm. like, it's not hard to get rid of a UTI. Like, it's something so simple, but they neglect to take it serious that, oh, because you are an incarcerated individual, that you lose your right as a human being, that it doesn't matter what happens to you. Um, some, another thing I feel like that should be a basic human need in the, for a woman is being close to your children. Like, why send mothers to the furthest place and then expect them to be able to parent and keep this bond and connection and nurture and love them, it's almost impossible. But of course, women are resilient and are amazing and they find ways to make it happen. But it's just obstacles that are put in place to keep women from being able to be moms and being able to have influence and being that nurturer that needs to be. Um, I was at Albion Correctional Facility, which is on the borderline of Canada. Like, and my family lived in Georgia, but when I was at Bedford Hills Correctional Facility, I was able to get a visit once a week. But once I moved to Albion Correctional Facility, I was not able to get one visit after I sent my daughter home, which was three years. So for three years, I wasn't able to see my child again until I came home, and it's just, it doesn't make sense. Um, another thing is, we need to start addressing people as human beings. So when you come into the correctional um, 
system. The first thing that state prison does is strip you of your name. They give you a number, and you're literally brainwashed to remember this number. You are identified as this number. They address you as this number. You are supposed to represent yourself as this number and not as the name or as the person that you are. So if we're talking about basic human need, and you treat me as property. Like, it makes no sense. Like, it, it doesn't add up. Like, how can we? So if you're giving somebody a number, and I still know my number. My number still to this day is 10G0418. And it's a number that if anyone is ever incarcerated, you don't forget that number because they drill it into you. That's your identity from that moment on. Um, and I know it's one other point that I want to mention. Oh, maybe not. <laughs> Um, but I just think overall that it's, it's kind of hard to change the criminal justice system that we have now. And of course, I definitely believe, like, I wish there was a better criminal justice system that we had and to make the conditions of what women have to go through better in the time while we're trying to end mass incarceration and stop sending women there to begin with, honestly. I'm going to ask you to pick up some of these themes. You know, it's been mentioned that so much of this work is trauma-informed, an estimated 90% of women who are incarcerated are there because of trauma they've experienced in their lifetimes. There's an estimated 80% of women incarcerated who struggle with substance abuse or other forms of addiction. Understanding this landscape, what are the baseline needs of women for treatment and rehabilitation? And what do those needs reflect, both about the policies and also the cultural norms that are bringing them into contact with the system. So I, I'm going to rely heavily on a report that just came out in March from John Jay um, Prisoner Reentry in Institute, Prisoner Reentry Institute, um, that is now being used in New York to do some front end prevention, um, trying to get women off Rikers Island and. Mm -hmm. Some of, the, some of the basic needs I think we've already hit on, we, we need substance abuse treatment that is gender specific and trauma informed. When people say trauma informed, I don't think people realize that that means that it has to be well staffed, in, not in terms only of numbers but also of excellence, that people understand what this woman's triggers are. What did she survive? If you don't know that, how are you going to help her overcome it, right? Um, s strong health care and strong mental health care, you know, basic critical things that you, you can't really move on with your life and heal without having those things. Um, employment and educational opportunities. The opportunity to do something about your socioeconomic status. Um, housing and housing insecurity. Um, one of the drivers of um, mass incarceration. If you, if you don't have a safe place to put your head at night, uh, it makes it very difficult to deal well in the world. And then um, family, dealing with children, dealing with extended family. So th these things have to exist in the community to prevent incarceration. Um, and I, I also want to just say a few words about how these programs are delivered. Um, it can't be cookie cutter. I, um, the recommendations are to develop practices, policies, and programs that are relational, that um, deal with healthy relationships in the community, and that, that provide some continuity of care. Um, so that as someone is coming back into her um, role, healthy role as a mom and provider and citizen and community member, that she has access in, on an ongoing basis to these services. Um, that the whole family is engaged. That there are, uh, there's modeling of safety, physical and emotional safety, and strong boundaries. That there's clarity in the tasks and consistency. Um, so these are some of the basics. Um, I strongly urge everyone who hasn't already read it to go on the John Jay um, Prisoner Reentry Institute website and look at this. It has become the um, blueprint for a front-end diversion program using five housing providers 
in New York City that I think um, is going to be pretty amazing. Um, but it's, it's a very different way of thinking about what you do in the aftermath mm -hmm. of a criminal charge in that it is not punitive but holistic and um, needs to affect every aspect of how the, the woman, the mom, is receiving treatment and participating in her own treatment. That's the, uh, another critical um, component is choice and collaboration, that she has control and is making choices. How do you learn to make better choices if you're being infantilized and can't make the most basic day-to-day -day living decisions as happens in prisons? Perfect, thank you. Uh, Bronwyn, I'm gonna ask you to pick up from there. It's almost a perfect place for you, given that you look at data-driven treatment strategies. And um, you also mentioned incarceration and women's incarceration specifically being a community issue. How does it become a mirror and implicate all of us ultimately? And how is that sort of broad responsibility reflected in how much we don't know about what's happening and what's working? Sure. So, um, it's our responsibility to decide um, on who our politicians are going to be that are going to pass laws and policies that benefit all of us. And those policies that we currently have in place do not benefit women and do not actually even raise awareness about women who are justice involved. Um, we know, for example, that trauma is um, a challenge that most women who are incarcerated experience. And, if they haven't experienced trauma before they got into the justice system, they are going to experience trauma just by going into the criminal justice system. Um, but we don't devote resources into communities, say, that have high levels of violence or trauma. Uh, we don't go into schools and try to identify um, young girls who may have been victimized and who could use supports um, and be provided with treatment that's actually very effective. Um, there are entire schools who have kids and young girls who have trauma symptoms that don't have the resources to address those symptoms. We also have to recognize that most women are not just going to f experience one isolated event of trauma. Um, it's going to be um, multiple instances of trauma and or abuse or exposure to different types of violence um, that then manifest themselves in a variety of ways. And so when we talk about trauma-informed treatment and being gender responsive, it's really understanding that the way a woman presents herself is actually a compilation of her experiences and many of them being traumatic and being able to do this. But the community often is not even aware of these issues or how to treat them. Um, our funding is not directed towards putting money into programs for women. So for example, um, I have, there was a request for proposals um, out a few years ago for a halfway house that they wanted to be gender responsive for women um, in the state of Connecticut. And I was excited to partner with a local community agency that really does great community work. Um, and we submitted an awesome application and I was super excited that this, they were going to get this project and the state actually decided to take the money away from funding a women's program and to put it into funding another house for men. So this is a common theme that we actually see happen, um, that the resources that are out there are often diverted away from women into men's programs for men or the justice system for men, and that we're still kind of um, working with an invisible population. In terms of research, you know, the gold standard for research is that we have randomized controlled trials, which means that we're going to take a random group of people and give half of them one treatment and half of them nothing, which in community work is really unethical, right? How can we actually just send some people to nothing and some people to something that we hope will be really great? Um, so what researchers have done instead has been creative and often they'll compare, say, like women-focused interventions to mixed gender interventions. And there's been some promising results for individual curriculums. Um, that are relational and trauma-informed, recognizing that women's relationships are really kind of the core of what we need to focus on, relationships with family, community, self. Um, and um, they have shown that there can be some impact on say, mental health symptoms and substance abuse. Um, but sometimes we don't necessarily see the desired reduction in recidivism. 
And a final thing that I would like to say as well in terms of research is that criminal justice focused research often focuses on recidivism as kind of this looming outcome that we want to achieve. And this is kind of what every state um, wants, what the federal government wants. Many states don't even collect recidivism data, so they don't even know what their recidivism rates are. Um, it becomes much more complicated when we actually go into the data to try and figure it out. But in terms of research, we need to be able to expand beyond just looking at recidivism. What are good outcomes for women? We want women to be connected with their families, connected with their communities, um, engaged. We want women to be able to vote and have housing that's stable and have their kids in good educational programs and schools and to further their education themselves if they so <laughs> desire. Um, we also want women to be eligible for resources that will support them, like food stamps, for example, which you may not be able to get if you were convicted of a drug felony in certain states. Um, so all of these things together are really um, kind of paves the way for a lot more work to be done at the research and policy levels. Well, thank you for calling us all in to more work to be done. I appreciate that. <laughs> um, so Representative Smith, let's bring this to Louisiana. And first of all, should just note that I think Louisiana has been on almost every justice reformer's lips recently. And I know we have some Louisiana folks in the front here. So shout out if you're from the state. Um, huge congratulations for a comprehensive reform package and really a bipartisan win. Uh, and I, I do want to thank uh, Justice uh, for actually being involved in helping those bills get passed because uh, it was a bipartisan and with a lot of collective work from a lot of people, we were able to, uh, I guess uh, the way we say it, move Louisiana from the negative title of the mass incarceration uh, title of the world. You know, we they say the country, but generally it's the world by populace. And uh, we do have a lot of people in prison. But this reform package that the governor put forth uh, this past session uh, is really going to help intensify some of the things that you're hearing here today, especially for, for women. And one that wasn't in the package, and I'm going to mention it right now, these two young ladies sitting here in the front. Stand up. <laughs> um, <laughs> advocates for a ban the box bill for college applications and they got they got it passed and I can tell you that it was a struggle with some folks but but to be able to allow individuals who uh, uh, want to have that opportunity to go to college to get a degree and uh, to be able to better themselves in a better job uh, is just tremendous and the box on that application prevented a lot of them, just like for jobs. Uh, we banned the box uh, last year for state employees uh, and uh, for unclassified. But our civil service department, after my pushing and prodding, was able <laughs> to hot. get uh, promulgated rules to, to be able to let classified employees also have the opportunity for the band of box not to be on the uh, application for, for their jobs. But, but this package that we passed uh, is going to look at uh, mandatory, mandatory minimum sentences, which we know is really a major part of why Louisiana has so many people in prison. Mm -hmm. So they're looking at some of the rules and changing those for drug abuse charges, for uh, second degree murder is also something that the law changed on us in Louisiana. You used to be able to get parole for um, eligibility for second degree, then they changed it to a life sentence. Now they're looking at it uh, again to be able to allow these individuals to have eligibility for parole. Uh, the food stamp issue was one, a bill passed. Uh, we are able now to allow individuals who have drug offenses, which includes a lot of females who uh, are able to take care of their parents, they're now, now able to get uh, SNAP benefits and TANF benefits uh, to take care of their families in Louisiana. But all of this is just a, just a drop in the bucket of what we need to do. We have budget constraints just like every other state does. And I've been in the House now, as I said, for 10 years. The first eight years under the former administration, we cut our health, um, mental, mental health. We cut beds in mental health. We cut the funding for mental health. Uh, and we changed our whole health system around to a public-private partnership, which is now even in dire straits for dollars. So uh, this bill, the bills that we passed, uh, includes a reinvestment portion uh, for the savings that we have 
on individuals being able to get out of prison uh, on parole or probation or even fully, uh, that that reinvestment will allow for more programming, for more mental health, for more substance abuse programs. And we find that, at least I know for a fact, that women, because they're a smaller population in Louisiana than the men, they do get lesser amounts of resources. So in my conversation with the secretary is, how do we equalize some of that to ensure that when we do these programmings, that we're doing them some, some gender-specific things as well for individuals who are in LCIW? And the first thing is really to get the prison back in order, because uh, being housed in a mill prison, some are in Angola, some are in a, a juvenile facility that we used to have. So they're scattered all over right now. So to get them back into um, an, an area where they can have that uh, discipline of being able to have these programs given to them in a better way. Uh, you can't do it when they're scattered uh, because you're doing other, you're trying to worry about safety more than anything else when they're scattered as they are. So uh, the most important thing is that these bills will be able to allow a lot of individuals to uh, be eligible for parole, changing our sentencing, and, uh, and, and we have provisional jobs that they can get certificates for. We also passed a bill last year when we did Ban the Box that an, uh, an individual leaving prison can get a certificate of employability. We do a lot of training in our prisons, especially for our men. <laughs> and, and Louisiana has a lot of jobs, but women were not getting these jobs. We're so high on high demand, high wage jobs. But then when you look at the high demand, high wage jobs for women, the only thing we were doing actually was the welding. Mm -hmm. uh, the other jobs were generally jobs that women could do, like I said, the horticultural, the clerical, uh, and culinary, things of that sort. So the most important thing is to get them involved as well and in those high demand, high wage jobs. But I can tell you that uh, we're going to work hard on these, not only these bills, but in the future, uh, for sessions to come up, uh, we're, we're not through. We, we've got to, we've got to definitely get more bills passed for uh, Louisiana so that we can no longer have that negative title. Uh, we want to at least be number three. <laughs> Coming for you, Oklahoma. Exactly. <laughs> um, well, I'll be honest with all of you. I have a lot more questions for our panelists, but we're running short on time. So I am going to turn it to the audience because I'm sure you have questions. And there's a hand up already. Do I have a mic runner in the room? Yes, in the back. Um, there is a woman up here in the front who would love to ask a question. And the mic is coming to you right now. <laughs> And if you could just introduce yourself. My name is Taylor Nubel, and I'm with the Who Speaks For Me project, which I started, 293-799. That's my vet number. Oh. DC, DOC. I mean, 931-971-59011. That's my vet number. DC, DOC, 293-799. My name is Taylor. Not Ms. Nubel. I'm Taylor. And I started my project because I live here in DC, and I can't get a job. I'm educated but I have a non-apparent disability. And that's what I want to speak to. There are two things. DC doesn't have its own prison. So we get sent to the feds. We get sent up to 500 miles away, meaning we don't have access to programs that are in the city, and we don't have access to our families and our friends. But nobody's really talking about the federal system and what's happening. The federal system is its own world. And all these things that I hear you all talking about, like why is this happening, let's just be honest. It's sexism, right? The same things that happen in society are the same things that translate into the prisons. They divide and conquer. They tell us there's so much we can get. So I want to talk about the sexism. But the other thing that I really want to talk about is trauma-related mental illness and how that's dealt with on the federal system. Because of the Prison Litigation Reform Act, you have very little access to the world. I always say they disappear you in prison. What are we doing about people who have non-apparent disabilities who are suffering? We have substance use disorder programs inside the prisons, but nothing that's a residential program for women who have trauma-related mental illness or any mental illness. And you turn us out on the streets and you tell us to survive. So I really want to hear someone speak to that. Um, 
and how you really look at someone. I am a person with a mental health issue, but throughout my entire trial, which was high profile, nobody wanted to believe or accept that whatever I was accused of doing, which was BS, um, <laughs> it really, when it comes down to it, was mental health and trauma. And while you say, Ms. Smith, you know, let's look at the trauma beforehand, what about building a trauma-informed justice system? Really, so. Thank you. Does anyone wanna tackle any of those specific pieces? I mean, I think you could have been on the panel, Definitely. so if you wanna do <laughs> <laughs> I, I, just, I, just, I just wanna say really briefly, it, uh, thank you for that. Yes. It needs to be community-based. Right. Um, and as wonderful as um, Senator Booker's bill is, it, 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 that is a gap, and so we need to address that. And dealing with the federal prisons, yeah. it's a lot difficult for us in the states uh, because we have no control of what happens at the federal prisons. We have to deal with the state issues, so um, that's something that we have to bring to Congress and have them look at how these things are happening in federal Absolutely. prisons. And I will say quickly, as my moderator's privilege, there are two new federal prisons that are poised to be brought online right now, so if you wanna to talk to me about how we make that not happen, I would love to talk to you. Um, we have a couple of women here in the front row and then one in the back there. So if we can get mics here, here, and there. And all right, you are, you've picked another person, wonderful. <laughs> you go ahead and ask your question too. Hi, I'm an educator and I wanna know what can I do? I see a lot of children who are affected um, by trauma and uh, I've actually, um, my whole entire career, I've worked with children whose parents are incarcerated. However, there's no services and so the most I can do is have an after school program and that's about it. So what can I do? What more can I do for them? Yeah, just charge up. Something. <laughs> I would like to say there are advocates, uh, advocate groups in Louisiana that I've been involved with, and generally uh, they have days where children are actually brought to the prisons. They even do um, backpacks for school back to school programs, uh, and they just have visitation days. So maybe that's something that you know, if there's no advocacy group that's available to look at trying to get some folks together to to do those kinds of things, uh, even the prison chaplain that used to be at LCIW would have a back to school and a, and a day for parents to relate to their children, just to have that time with them. So uh, it's really important and it's very, very important that they do that because when I visited prisons, when you meet a mother and a daughter in prison, that's hard. It's hard and, and, and they know that it's hard as well because not only is, uh, is that daughter there, the grandchildren are somewhere else or great-grandchildren or somewhere else uh, in someone else's hands. I have some specific thoughts, but let's take it offline. Let's talk afterwards. Appreciate that. Thank you. We're going to have to crank through the questions. So one here in the front row from Tamar. Thank you. Yes. Um, I was wondering if the panel could address the kind of stark divide that we often have when we're talking about people convicted of nonviolent offenses and people convicted of violent offenses and the damage that does to how and how we think about who's deserving of punishment and who is deserving of support and of resources. And I'm wondering if the panel could also address how racism really fuels that narrative and that damage, as well as the system. And then also about the resilience and the leadership of women who are on the inside in challenging that. Wow. Tamara's giving us a heavy slate. <laughs> <laughs> if I can say, just say it came up during our bills that we just passed. Uh, very reluctant to look at the violent offenders. The DAs and the sheriffs were on the total outside, outskirts of dealing with that. So a task force was put together to be able to look at what kind of bills we could draft in the future to deal with violent offenders. But every time you do a bill uh, and it deals with violent offenders uh, in a state like Louisiana, lock them up, throw away the key, uh, we were always faced with either having it prospective never being retroactive, and even prospective ones don't pass. Mayashi. So I, I, this is like one of the most loaded and crucial topics, mm -hmm. I feel like. I feel like at the root of everything, we need to look at the fact that these same driving forces that people who have nonviolent crimes 
are the same driving forces that people who have violent crimes, and it's on an individual basis. So you cannot look at, oh, the penal code labeled you violent crime, so now you're a violent person, which is not realistic. I was, like, I have a violent crime, and my crime is considered violent because of a penal code, but it never involved another person, it never involved any weapons or any kind of anything that you can use as a weapon. But still, I'm labeled as a violent person, which I'm not a violent person, and the many people that I know that have violent crimes are not violent people either. But then it keeps us stagnated, because if we cannot see past the violent and nonviolent divide, we're not able to ever end mass incarceration of women, because maybe on a federal level is not such a high percent, but on a state level, it's more than one third. So if it's more than one third on a state level, that is a big population of why is why was violence in the situation to begin with? And what made that person? Was that person having to fight for their life? So then now we need to just discard them and they have no right and throw away the key. Um, so I think we need to kind of stop being one-sided and narrow-minded when it comes to the violent and nonviolent and get down to the root causes, which are the same on both spectrums. But then on the leadership part, because I can't not speak to that. <laughs> that that's um, for you. That was for you. <laughs> um, we need to recognize that women that have direct experience has been fighting the fight from the very beginning. Like it started on the inside when they had when they created the HIV peer education program that's modeled around the country that was started at Bedford Hills Correctional Facility by the women that were incarcerated. When they brought education back into the facility after it was taken away, women have been leaders and have the, you know, they have the drive and the resilience to do what is necessary. It's just that they, you know, there's forces, which we know, and racism and sexism and all those play into it, takes away those tools so we can be stuck and not have, you know, reach our full potential. And I feel like, and then we come home, and then we create, you know, like the anti-shackling campaign or ban the box um, from applications um, for school and for work. And these are the kind of things that we do because we are leaders and we are change agents. Once you give us the opportunity, instead of keeping us in this little box saying that we are either victims or we are violent people, remove the labels and look at us as who we are complex individual, multidimensional. So. Excellent. Excellent. Okay, I see you have the microphone, and I, you're the last question, or they're going to tackle me off the stage. <laughs> and then I'm going to, so if you could keep it brief and pointed, sure. I would be immensely grateful. Thank uh, you. This question is basically directed, I think, at Ms. Smith or Dr. Dr. Hunter. Uh, I want to take it back to the trauma. Where would be the optimal or the best place to have women treated for trauma? Is it in prison or outside prison? I bring the question up because I know I have, I've spoken with some women who actually expressed to me that they didn't recognize that they had trauma until they were in prison. So I just want you to, uh, to kind of engage the pros and cons of having it start in prison and outside. Thank you. I, I think that's really interesting because there are some good programs in prisons and because um, they engage um, peer groups of women. I, that's absolutely true. I, you know, I've known women who didn't know that they were um, considered, uh, that their case would have been considered domestic violence. It was so normalized for them. I don't think that that means that prison is the best place to have those programs. I you know, worked inside jails and prisons in the Chicago area for 28 years and have been going into prisons in New York. And I think there are many good people working inside, and yet the culture of corrections is so hard to challenge. And politically, the, um, the unions are so powerful, it's so difficult to hold those systems accountable to truly trauma-informed care. I have heard more than one psychologist opine that real personal growth cannot happen in those environments because they're too unsafe. You sit in a group and it's a good group and you open yourself up and then you go back to your living unit and you know are sexually harassed or demeaned or called out of your name 
by an officer who will never be disciplined for that, nope. ever. Mm -hmm. so, so I really want to see us move from the front end toward a model. The, the, we had a great model that never got implemented in the Family Unity Demonstration Project Act. Small models based in people's communities, engaging the family, being holistic. Um, there's, I know that there's been a lot of good work around gender-informed practice assessments and that those models are supposed to permeate the entire facility in how women are treated, in how everyone treats each other, but I don't see it actually happening. I agree. I mean, I think everything you said is right on, but I would like to say ideally we would want to divert women away from the criminal justice yes. system. I mean, we don't want to see them <laughs> end up in prison. And by providing um, more comprehensive care in the community and by increasing the conversations that we have about trauma and what it actually looks like, we can then actually increase awareness so that somebody may actually realize, um, you know, hey, this is what's going on with me. I also want to mention that, you know, the criminal justice system is stigmatizing but along with that goes substance abuse and mental health and um, gender and race and class and all of these different things that kind of work together. So we have to have a parallel process of what's going on in the communities um, with policies so that we can try to really change the system. Um, but ideally we would want to divert women away from ever going to prison and to treat trauma in the community. Yoshi, did you want to add? I saw a look of abject yeah. horror on your face at one point, and it was just a strong plus one to diversion. Yes. Um, <laughs> as someone that experienced trauma and then went to prison and then realized, oh, wow, I was traumatized so many times, it's not the prison that allows you to realize, oh, wow, this is, you know, an opportunity for me to realize that I have trauma. It's one, the relationships that you build with women, and two, before you even become, and before you get into the system, it's on the front page. Like, it's being addressed in a court that you were traumatized. Like, everything that you can think of is being plastered and used against you. So you being trauma, uh, traumatized as a child or as an adult or as a teenager, uh, some form in your life, like, is there for everyone to see, including yourself. And then it's the realization, like, oh, wow. Like, I was traumatized. And now that I don't have the responsibilities of society that demands all these responsibilities on you to worry about your insides, and now you can actually realize and, re like, reflect. So it's not the prison system, and I don't think anybody would say bring in a, a trauma-informed program into a prison is the key to even addressing trauma, because it is a hostile situation. And anybody that's been to prison or jail would know you cannot fully recover from anything when you're in a moment of being traumatized once again. Like, it's just not possible. All right, so I, I'm afraid that we have to end there only because we have so much more incredible programming for you today. Um, I do want to recap something we heard here by referring back to something that Senator Harris mentioned. Uh, when she said, you know, the, the best way to think about epidemics is to think about prevention. And she framed it in the context of drug abuse, um, of other social issues. But I would say something that came up here is the only way to think about the epidemic of mass incarceration is to prevent people from going in in the first place. And so thinking about treatment ultimately then becomes a case for decarceration. So take that forward out of this room. I look forward to talking to you and a huge round of applause for these amazing, amazing women.